Hello, my name is Chris Tarzan Clemens. First of all, no, my mom did not give me the middle name Tarzan. I picked that up on the Appalachian Trail, which was the initiation of my anti-comfortable lifestyle. I'm really excited to be joining you today. I actually attended an event much like Hobie when I was in high school. I went through the RILA Rotary Youth Leadership Award seminar, and it really was life-changing. I learned a lot about self-confidence, public speaking, community development, leadership, and I'm excited for what you're experiencing, and I'm just really happy to be here. I'm gonna speak briefly today about living what I call an anti-comfortable lifestyle. I took the skills that I learned at RILA, and when I graduated from college in Indiana with a marketing degree, I landed my first job in Southern California. Over the next few years, I worked really hard to become a successful young professional, joining organizations, working my way up in the industry, and I was even awarded a Graduate of the Last Decade Award for my university. So all in all, it seemed like I was a very successful young professional, until I ended up on a hike to the top of Half Dome in Yosemite with two of my good friends. One of them offhandedly remarked, maybe we should quit our jobs and through hike the Appalachian Trail. I really didn't know much about the Appalachian Trail at the time, but I knew I wasn't feeling quite as inspired at work, so I took him up on that. After a little bit of research, I learned that the Appalachian Trail, or the AT, is 2,184 miles long. It starts on Springer Mountain in Georgia, crosses through 14 states along the East Coast, and finishes at the top of Mount Katahdin in Maine. My friend and I quit our jobs, packed our backpacks, and headed to Georgia in the spring of 2012. For the next four and a half months, I lived on the Appalachian Trail. I slept in my tent and every morning packed it in my backpack and walked north. We followed thousands of these white blazes that were painted on trees, signposts, rocks, and sidewalks. I learned really quickly that everything on my pack was weighting me down, so I sent home as many things as I could, including my camp stove. For the rest of the trek, I ate cold food in the woods, which included this lunch, which is not gourmet. Yeah, I would pour a packet of couscous and flavorings into a water bottle, let it sit for an hour, and then tip it back and drink my dinner. In town, we took advantage of everything that we could, including fast food restaurants, all-you-can-eat buffets, and these one-pound hamburgers that made up for my not-so-tasty lunches in the woods. As I continued walking north, I crossed the Mason-Dixon line and went from hiking the Appalachian Trail in the south to the Appalachian Trail in the north. We climbed up and out of the green tunnel of the south and crossed these vast wild landscapes with wide open views. And 136 days later, I reached the northern terminus of the Appalachian Trail on top of Mount Katahdin and Nain and became an Appalachian Trail through hiker for the year 2012. One of the biggest things that I learned on the AT was that the less stuff that I had, the less I had to worry about, and actually the more I enjoyed it. I sent home so much gear and cut my pack weight in half that when I returned home, I realized that I wanted to live with less. And that got me thinking about this anti-comfortable thought. I didn't want to come home and just settle back into a comfortable routine, but I also couldn't just go on hiking the Appalachian Trail forever. Anti-comfortable to me was something that would test my limits, challenge me every day, and keep me invigorated and inspired for life. And I broke it down into three areas. First, I knew from the AT that I wanted to continue to be physically active. Second, I wanted to live with less. And third, I wanted to see more of the world. I didn't exactly know how to make all of that work, but over the next couple of years, I poured all of my energy into making that a sustainable lifestyle. I knew the first thing that I had to do was take care of the pent up energy locked inside my legs. I'd always been a runner, but after the Appalachian Trail, I came home and my brother and I ran our first ultra marathon. A month after returning from the AT, we drove down to the Santa Monica Mountains in Calabasas and ran a 50 kilometer race. And after six grueling, hot, dusty hours, we finished the 31 mile event. We were both addicted. We made a lot of great friends in the trail running community. And a few months later, we went over to the Grand Canyon in Arizona and ran rim to rim to rim, which is a 47 mile run starting from the South Rim, running all the way down to the bottom of the Colorado River, up to the North Rim, turning around and doing it all back to the South Rim. That one took us about 14 hours. One of my favorite races was in Prescott, Arizona. It is the man against horse 50 mile race. About 30 runners race against 30 horseback riders through single track trails in the mountains. And it's very interesting to be racing against horses. I've also done some pretty silly things. One morning I woke up in Santa Barbara and wondered what it would be like to run a marathon around a city block. 
So I packed a bag with a little bit of food, walked down to the corner, and started running circles. 89 loops later, I finished a marathon and realized that was really, really boring. Now, eventually, I worked my way up to the pinnacle of ultra marathon running, and I ran the Burning River 100-mile endurance race in Cleveland, Ohio. And with the help of my crew and family and pacers, I finished that 100-mile race in 24 hours and 15 minutes. And more recently, my most recent 100-mile race was the Plain 100 held in the Cascade Mountains in Washington State. It's a completely unsupported, unmarked, unguided trail race. You're totally on your own. You carry your own food. You find your own water. And I finished that 100-mile race, which was actually more like 109 miles in 31 hours and 47 minutes. I was even getting a little bit comfortable with running, so I tried something different, and a few friends and I joined the Race Across America, a 3,000-mile bicycle race from Oceanside, California to Annapolis, Maryland. We were a four-person team, so at any given time, one of us was on the bicycle. And once we started, we were continually moving from California to the East Coast. And after running, riding through 115 degree heat in the California deserts, and then hailstorms and rainstorms through the plains and the east, we finally reached Annapolis, Maryland in seven days, four hours and 28 minutes completing the race across America. And then my most recent adventure finally got me back to backpacking and the Appalachian Trail style. I was in Germany doing some work with a client and when that was over, I bought a backpack and I hiked the Camino de Santiago all the way across Spain from the border of France to the Atlantic Ocean. And it was really nice to get back to the uh, long distance backpacking lifestyle. With all of these physical endurance events, I think it's pretty safe to say I had figured out goal number one in my anti-comfortable lifestyle. I wanted to be physically active and I had figured out a way to make it sustainable in, in my life. The next step was living with less, and by no means did I have a lot. When I returned to Santa Barbara, California, I lived in a small one-room apartment, but even coming home, I looked around and realized I felt like I still had too much. I started getting rid of things, I ended up moving out of my apartment, couch surfing and living in friends' places, and at this time we were traveling every weekend doing ultra endurance runs, and I was camping every single weekend in my Honda Element. And finally one day I realized, why don't I just live in this full time? I built a full-time home in the back of the car with a sleeping platform, storage underneath, uh, drawers for my clothes, and even a closet because uh, I was actually still working a full-time job while I was living on the streets, and I was even the youngest Rotary Club president for the Rotary Club of Santa Barbara, and quite possibly the only homeless Rotary Club president in Rotary's history. After several months of living in the Honda, I decided to upgrade to an old Volkswagen camper van and this is what it looks like when you live in a vehicle on moving day. I drove them both down to the beach and within an hour I had moved all of my possessions from one vehicle to the other. The VW van offered an upgrade in interior living space and it even came with a kitchen. I had a two burner propane stove, running water, a refrigerator, and plenty of storage. It really was the ideal home on wheels and made it perfect for adventure travel. I now had two of my three anti-comfortable lifestyle goals achieved. I was physically challenging myself on adventures on a regular basis, and I was living a much more minimalistic lifestyle. The third goal was still there. I wanted to see more of the world, and I was actually perfectly set up to do that in a home on wheels. Except for one thing, I was still tied to Santa Barbara to get that paycheck from my office job. I loved the company I was working for, but there was just no way to make it remote. So I thought creative for a while. I called up the original company who had hired me and moved me to California, and I asked them for my job back with two caveats. I wanted to not have to work in an office, and I wanted to be able to do my work from anywhere, anywhere around the world. Luckily, they said yes, and with my first digital nomad income stream, I was able to leave Santa Barbara and start traveling full time. For the last six years, I've been living and working remote from all 50 states, 27 different countries and on five different continents. Wherever I can find Wi-Fi is my office, whether it's a hotel or hostel, a cafe or a coffee shop, a friend's house, or even sometimes my client's warehouse where I'm able to pull in my home on wheels and set up house for a few days to get a lot of work done. While I do have a degree in marketing, it's most definitely not in digital marketing. Over the past few years, I've had to continue to teach myself new skills that will allow me to make money on my own. I've taught myself website development, 
photo and video editing, creative graphic design, and a lot of other things. I know I've spent more time in the last decade learning through YouTube and Google than I ever did in college. And I think it's that innate curiosity and the drive for me to continue to add new skills that's making this lifestyle and profession sustainable for me. But living on the road wasn't just about the work. I, I did it because I wanted to have adventures. Unfortunately, I had a few things to figure out first. Traveling full time brought some new challenges. I had to learn where to find free places to sleep because I didn't want to blow all of my income on campsites and hotels. The first year I spent a lot of nights in truck stops, Walmart parking lots, and highway rest areas. Another thing I had to learn was how to take a shower. In Santa Barbara I had a gym membership, but on the road I couldn't afford to pay for gyms everywhere I went, so I bought a cheap solar shower and took cold showers in the backs of parking lots and on the sides of roads. And then almost most importantly, I had to learn how to be incredibly patient and flexible. Driving a 30-year-old van around the United States is not one of the most dependable things to do. I broke down many times and got to know lots of tow truck drivers and even one time had to sleep in a mechanic shop parking lot for several days while we waited for a vintage Volkswagen part to be delivered. But all those challenges offered a lot more in rewards and I really enjoyed visiting national parks, seeing friends and family around the United States, and camping in a lot of incredible places. The first year on the road, I spent five months driving around the US, covered 20,000 miles, and really felt like I had dialed in the digital nomad van life lifestyle. By this point, I was feeling like I wasn't being challenged enough, and I thought that I should take this digital nomad idea internationally. I didn't really care where I was going to go, so I wrote down six countries on a piece of paper, all that were relatively inexpensive, warm in the winter, and sounded like a fun place to go. I rolled a die, and number six came up, which was Ecuador on the paper. So I packed a backpack with my laptop and whatever I thought I would need for several months, put the van into storage, and bought a one-way flight to Ecuador. For the next few months, I explored the mountains, made my way down to the Amazon, spent a week in the Galapagos Islands, met a guy who was driving a Volkswagen van just like mine from New Mexico to the bottom of South America. I jumped in with him and his dog and we rambled down the Peruvian coastline from surf spot to surf spot. I made my way to Cusco and hiked the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. And after three months in South America, I knew that this digital nomad international lifestyle was also sustainable. And I was looking forward to more adventures around the world. Over the next few years, I followed summer from the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere. My good friend joined me in my Volkswagen van to drive across the Trans-Canada Highway from Vancouver Island all the way out to Newfoundland. He and I later met up in South America and did a bicycle tour through Chile, Argentina, to the bottom of the world in Ushuaia, and then Uruguay. A year later, I met him in Asia and we did a motorbike trip through Vietnam and then uh, Myanmar. And a good friend and co-worker of mine was going to be stationed in Australia for a winter. So I joined him down under. We lived in Australia for two months. And then before returning to North America, we stopped by New Zealand and rented a camper van and spent a few weeks touring the South Island. After three years living in the Volkswagen van and crisscrossing North America on paved highways, I decided I wanted something that was a little more off-road ready. I sold the van and bought a, an old Toyota pickup truck converted the truck bed to a home on wheels, and spent a summer out west rambling out into some really remote, rugged off-road trails in the wilderness. The following winter, I purchased a slide-in pop-up truck camper that would go on the back of the Toyota and would give me a living space a lot more like the Volkswagen van. And when it was all popped up, I had a kitchen with a three-burner propane stove, a sink with running water, a refrigerator that operated off of solar power and even a heater for the nights when it got really cold. With the off-road ready Toyota, I was finally able to accomplish one of my dreams of seeing Alaska. And in the summer of 2019, I drove all the way up the Alaska Highway through Canada to Fairbanks and then all the way up the Dalton Highway, which is one of the most remote roads in the entire world. And at the end of it is Prudhoe Bay, where I was able to jump in and swim in the Arctic Ocean before turning south and heading back down to the lower 48. My goal was actually to continue driving the truck south into Mexico, through Central America, and to the bottom of South America. But in the winter of 2019, I decided to take a quick break and put the truck into storage and flew to Southeast Asia for a few months. 
I spent two months living on Bali, and then I landed in Thailand for a three-week stay before going to India to work a trade show for one of my clients. Unfortunately, while I was in Thailand, COVID-19 began to spread rapidly, and the entire world went into a global lockdown. My three-week trip to Thailand has been extended to a year and a half, and I'm still here living on Koh Lanta, a little island in the Andaman Sea, waiting for the world to get back to normal and inter international travel to reopen. After eight months being locked down on Lanta, the restrictions in Thailand began to loosen and I was able to finally have an adventure again. I bought an inexpensive mountain bicycle, put some touring gear on it, and caught the ferry back to the mainland and did a 1,000 mile bicycle tour from the south of Thailand up to Chiang Mai in the north, enjoyed the Loi Kirtong festival, and then did another 600 mile loop through the very rough rugged and incredibly steep mountains in northern Thailand before I shipped the bicycle back to the south and I've been back on Lanta for the last few months. I'm actually able to stay in Thailand because I am on a long-term educational visa. Several of my friends and I are on a Muay Thai educational visa, which is the Thai art of kickboxing. I can't say that I'm going to return to the United States an accomplished Muay Thai fighter, but it's nice that I'm able to stay here long term and it is really one heck of a workout. While the adventures, places, and pictures are definitely a nice perk of this anti-comfortable digital nomad lifestyle, I've come to understand that it's not the biggest benefit. The ability for me to own my time and own my location is what really matters. When I lived in Santa Barbara and had a regular job, I had two weeks of vacation and I would have to split that with myself and my family. But now that I'm able to work from anywhere and choose where I want to be, I've spent a lot more time with the people who are important to me, my mom and my dad, my brother, and most importantly, my grandfather. Each summer, I would return to North America and live with my grandpa for a few weeks up to a month. I slept on his floor, I hung out with his friends, we played bingo and had meals together. And every time grandpa told one of his friends about my life, they would invariably say, I wish I would have done that when I was your age. And I think that's incredible advice to get from someone in their 80s or 90s. When I was in New Zealand, I got the call that Grandpa was going into hospice care and they didn't know how long he had left. I booked a flight home, not sure if I'd be able to see him or not, but when I landed, I was able to spend the last two months of his life sitting beside his hospice bed every day, working on my laptop, feeding him, talking with him, and taking care of him. When he finally did pass, I was just very thankful that I had the opportunity and the time and the ability to do that. I hope that at the end of my own life, I can look back and be most proud of the ability to own my time and own my place and the ability to spend it with the people who are most important to me. So what's next? I really don't know. I'm still here in Thailand. My visa is good for another three months and then I have to make a decision. I still have dreams of driving my truck to the bottom of South America, but I'm also contemplating doing it on a bicycle or I'd like to take a bicycle to Europe and ride across Europe. I'd like to visit Africa. I'd like to do some more ultra marathons. I have a lot of ideas and a lot of goals and I don't know what it's going to be, but I know one thing is for certain. I'm gonna continue challenging myself physically, living with less and trying to see as much of the world as possible. I'm gonna continue living this anti-comfortable lifestyle. Now, I don't think comfort and routine are actually bad. I also don't think that owning a home and working in an office is a bad thing. I just don't think it's for me. I joke with friends that if my family and friends didn't own homes, then I would never have a driveway to sleep in and a free washing machine to use. So anti-comfortable is going to be different for everyone. I think what you're doing right now with Hobie is anti-comfortable. You're each stepping out of your own individual comfort zones. You're meeting new people, learning new skills, and opening up to new ideas and cultures. The world is an interconnected place, as we've all seen with the global pandemic. Something that happens in one part of the world is going to impact everyone else. And I truly believe that you as our next generation of leaders, professionals, athletes, politicians, and diplomats, you're going to have the opportunity to make a bigger impact than previous generations. I know with my experience in Ryla, a seminar like this was something that opened up my eyes to a broader worldview and stoked my curiosity to continue learning and expanding my own comfort zone. And it also gave me the self-confidence to go out into the world and create my own path to what some people might today think is non-traditional or maybe a silly lifestyle. So whatever you're learning at Hobie, 
just know this, it's not the end, it's just the beginning. And I hope that you go away from this with inspired passion to continue learning and expanding your own comfort zones. And if there's one thing I can leave you with, I suggest staying in touch with all the people and friends that you're making right now. I can tell you with my experience that the bonds that you're creating and the friendships that you're having are going to be lasting and they'll be with you years down the road. Thank you again for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. I hope you're having a great seminar. I hope you have a great rest of your sessions and just thank you and good luck with everything.